On this episode of the Naturist Living Show, Naturism and Health. This episode of the Naturist Living Show is brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. At Bear Oaks, we offer traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Free your body, free your mind. www.bearoaks.ca Welcome, dear listener, to the second episode for July 2012. The second one because I was late with the June episode, so I'm catching up by putting two in July so that we're back to essentially one a month on average. Again, I apologize for being late on the last one. I actually heard from a number of people who were anticipating the last podcast and were disappointed when they didn't get it on time. But uh, we're back on track, and hopefully I'll keep having one a month from here on. As I said in the last podcast, it's been an incredibly busy summer. It's been fantastic. The weather certainly has helped. But the fact we've been around for over five years as Bear Oaks, the park's been around since 72, but as Bear Oaks with a new philosophy, the non-clothing optional philosophy, the ethical naturist philosophy that we've talked about, all that seems to be resonating quite well uh, with people, which is why we're growing so fast. Uh, last weekend, we uh, we played our introductory video 22 times. We keep track of that. Uh, that means that there was at least 22 visits, uh, first-time visits, because we only play it for people on their first visit. It explains all about the park and who we are and what the expectations are and what our philosophy is. So 22 plays likely means about 50 people, because sometimes we'll play it for a couple, sometimes we'll play it for a whole family, sometimes we'll play it for a single but uh, often, when it's uh, the beginning of the day, we'll play it to uh, two or three couples at the same time uh, because they're all showing up at, to, to enjoy the day for their first visit. So we, we are essentially overwhelmed. I mean, it's a great problem, but we are overwhelmed with new people, the vast, vast majority who've never been here before. And for all those people who say that only old folks are interested in naturism, that's a bunch of bunk. And let me tell you how two weeks ago we had our family weekend and we had many, many families come for the first time. We had uh, families that were here who had babies and infants who couldn't really participate in family weekend but just wanted to be here with other families. I uh, personally talked to five families who were here for their first visit ever and their first time trying naturism and they all loved it and they're all talking about coming back and Taking membership, some of them are just sad because they live so far away and they can't come more often. And then um, about a week ago, I was here on a Tuesday and I came into the office and there were uh, five young women uh, between ages 17 to 18 from high school who decided that they were going to make a day of trying naturism and they all got into one car. I suppose when you're that age, you probably are, don't have that many cars between all of you. And these uh, five w young women, who uh, all come from the same high school about half an hour from here, decided to make a day of it. And they loved it as well. They're talking about coming back now for camping. And they're talking about uh, putting together maybe a team for the volleyball tournament. Um, and on my way here, I'm at Bear Oaks right now. And uh, it's a beautiful day. It's, uh, it's the middle of the week. Uh, but I uh, came across another couple of young women who are in their early 20s, who uh, are here for three days. And it's their first time trying naturism ever. And they just found our website, and they found what we were talking about interesting. And they are very, very excited and very happy. They really talk like they're really loving being here. So attracting new people to naturism, uh, attracting young people to naturism, I don't know what the problem is. We don't seem to have any problems at all. I 
often talk about uh, the ethical side of naturism and then the psychological and emotional benefits, and, and those are huge. I mean, I think that's the biggest uh, problem that we have in our society, and, and as ethical naturists, um, we are looking to make a better world and heal people, uh, heal people because of the phobias and the problems they have. But there are physical benefits to naturism, too. It's not all as clear-cut, I think, as the emotional ones, and perhaps not as big of an issue, but there are a number of physical health benefits. And In fact, in the beginning of naturism, it was just about that. Uh, the, 100 years ago, uh, naturism was a movement about physical health. Uh, it was vegetarian. It was uh, no alcohol, no smoking, mandatory calisthenics in the morning, cold showers, strengthening your body. It was all about being healthy. And certainly when you look at what the world was like 100 years ago, um, it was polluted. Uh, factories were in cities, and there was absolutely no controls over the emissions. Um, London got its reputation as a foggy city, not because of fog, but because of smog and smoke from the uh, all the coal that was being burned in London for heating and in factories that was making it so that you couldn't see where you're going, and it was like night during the day. So that certainly wasn't healthy, and people, of course, were working in these filthy, dirty city. There was a lot of disease because sanitation wasn't really that strong 100 years ago. A uh, few people had flush toilets. Um, there was uh, medical advances were limited in terms of our knowledge of sanitation as well and, and bacteria and disease and how it spreads. It was generally cities were, were places for, for sickness, yet everybody was moving into the cities or had moved in because of the Industrial Revolution. There was a lot of poverty, a lot of inequality. A hundred years ago was the beginning of uh, the ideas of communism and, and things like that. And it was all because it was so unhealthy. And so the getting out there and getting out of the oppressive clothing, because, of course, we're also in the Victorian era, coming out of the Victorian era, where you're wearing layers upon layers of clothing. And if you look at pictures of what people were wearing for swimming, we're talking about wool suits that went from your ankles to your neck. Uh, can you imagine what that would feel like to swim in? So naturism back then was very much about health, but even today it's about health. We had a very interesting show uh, with uh, Dr. Hollick about his book on vitamin D and the benefits of taking vitamin D from the sun. We have, uh, I have a member here at Bear Oaks who has eczema, and only by spending a day or two a week without any clothes on and in the sun does he keep it under control. Um, we have uh, people who have visited us who express physical benefits to, to naturism. Um, you know, we really screw up our bodies by binding it and shutting it and keeping it dark in a dark, damp, moist environment all the time. We're not letting our skin do its natural thing. They, in fact, there was a couple that was here um, just, uh, I think, a couple weeks ago, and she expressed a strong health benefits for trying naturism for the first time. My name is Samantha, and I'm 22 years old. And you came to Bear Oaks for the first time just about a week ago, right? That's right. Was that your first time trying naturism? It was, yes. And what did you think of it? It was uh, really good. It was especially good for the anxiety problems that I have. I felt that I was just peeling everything off, and I wasn't being judged by anybody. So it didn't. It wasn't just fun for you. It actually had some beneficial health effects. You felt exactly. Do you have any idea why? Um, I feel. I think it's mostly my anxiety is social anxiety, and a lot of it's being judged by other people. So I think because like I wasn't being judged on my clothes or my hair or anything like that, it just it helped me. Helped me like be able to have conversations with anybody who came up and said hi to us. Okay, it's true that it's it's a psychological benefit that she's describing in terms of anxiety, but uh, the fact that she's taking medication is physical, and uh, the fact that she doesn't have to certainly would improve her physical health. And, of course, the mind and the body can't just be completely divorced from each other. They have uh, important connections between the two of them. So a healthy mind leads to a healthy body and to physical health as well. But to be more specific, there was another couple that was here a few weeks ago, and uh, they also expressed some surprising health benefits that they didn't expect. My name is Grace, and I'm 30 years old. 
And so this is your uh, your second time here at Bear Oaks, and uh, just a few weeks ago was your first visit ever as a naturist. What was that like? Um, to be honest, at first it was extremely overwhelming. Um, driving up the lane here was just like a very scary experience. Um, I was really anxious, and then walking in, and you're kind of walking up to the front desk going, okay, I know there's naked people here. I'm going to be naked very soon. I've agreed to do this. Um, was just, it was very anxiety producing. Um, but then I walked in and I was like, okay, I need to take my clothes off. This feels really weird. I need to get naked. And as soon as I took my clothes off, I felt a lot better. That's a very common experience, which is great. Um, but what's really interesting with you is you experience also some health benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I had had a severe headache. Actually, most of that week I'd had very bad headaches. Um, and when we woke up, I was feeling so bad. My husband debated that maybe we would just cancel. And I said, no, no, this is our weekend away. Um, we're leaving our kids behind. So we're just going to go. Um, so I was feeling absolutely horrible. Um, checked my clothes and within a half an hour started feeling significantly better. And then I went the entire rest of the weekend without a headache. Well, that's great. I mean, uh, a health cure without drugs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, the other thing is your husband told me that you have some difficulty with uh, temperature and feeling warm and feeling cold. Um, did you experience the same thing here? Um, actually, I experienced the opposite. Normally, um, I'm really cold. I have a really hard time regulating my temperature properly. Often I'll have to resort to taking extremely hot baths to to raise my temperature manually, I like to say it, um, because it's not regulating on its own. And so I had, the whole winter, my husband had said, um, take your clothes off, you'll be fine. And I said, no, I'm going to be too cold. Um, so I kept my clothes on. I was fine the whole weekend. Other people were in clothes and I wasn't, my body was perfectly happy and normal. I was sure I was going to end up just so cold and teeth chattering and not be able um, to have a normal temperature, and I was fine. Wow, that's interesting. So this is the second week, and or the second time you've been here for a weekend, and uh, were there any health benefits that you noticed this time? Um, that's interesting that you asked, because this time when I came, I was in the middle of um, a flare-up. I have chronic fatigue syndrome, and which does mean what it sounds. My body gets extremely tired. Um, but it also affects my joints, my muscles, my immune system. Um, it also affects my balance. And I I was in the middle of an attack where not only was I extremely sore and painful, not able to do a lot, um, but I could barely do even little chores. Um, by the end of the day, I was so tired. I couldn't keep my eyes open. Um, I would be doing something and then suddenly stop talking because I could no longer, I was, so tired that I couldn't form sentences anymore, could not form words, could not keep my eyes open to the point where sometimes I would just start to fall over. It was really, really scary. And again, we'd kind of done the, okay, we're going on this camping trip again and I can't do anything. Um, the morning we left, I went to roll over in bed and that effort was so hard. My muscles were just shaking from exhaustion. Um, I got here And I've been here a day and a half. Yesterday, I had two very, very mild spells of dizziness. No exhaustion. I did not sleep all last night, and I'm doing really well. I've swam around the lakes a couple times. I've done tons of walking, um, and I'm fine. And you can tell I'm speaking reasonably well. You seem actually pretty happy. So you're never going to want to put your clothes back on? No. (laughs) I like being naked. So again, very strong testimony. This is not scientific, but so many people feel better when they're here, when they take their clothes off, when they let their bodies act and behave naturally. It's it is it just a coincidence? Is it psychological? Maybe. But if you feel better, then you are better. And so I I don't think it's the cure for all ills, but I think it's a, a cure to a lot of them. And I think it would be a much better world if we could let our bodies be much more natural and act naturally. And so do you see what I mean why naturism is is about ethics and morals? It's it's unethical to not let people know that there's a, a way that they could be healthier and happier and better for it all. Ethical naturism is about 
not just being naked because it feels good, but because there's so many benefits and because you can be such a, a better person. And on that, there is one book, which I think we've mentioned before, one book which uh, makes a very, very strong connection. Uh, the book is called Dress to Kill. Perfect. I mean, I, I don't know what else I can say to that. However, they're talking more specifically about bras and a link between bras and cancer. The book is by Sidney Ross Singer and Soma Grishmeyer. And of course, I, we sell the book in the Bear Boutique because it's a very, very interesting book. It's a fascinating correlation. But I couldn't just leave it there. I had to give them a call and find out more about it directly from them. And of course, I recorded the interview so I could share with you. So it's it's a pleasure talking to you. Um, I read the book a number of years ago, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, But for the sake of our listeners who may not have heard about the book or read it, can you summarize a little bit uh, what the book is about and what you uh, conclude? Yes. Well, Dress to Kill, which we, uh, we published in 1995, was the uh, culmination of two years of research that we did in the early 90s called the Bra and Breast Cancer Study. And what we, uh, we interviewed about 5,000 women, about half of them had breast cancer, and we wanted to know their lifestyle habits relating to bra wearing. And the uh, results were astounding. Uh, we found that the longer, uh, the longer a woman wears a bra throughout the day, uh, the greater her chances of developing breast cancer. And in fact, uh, it's four times bigger than the link between cigarettes and lung cancer, and it's a huge connection. And bra-free women have about the same incidence of breast cancer as a man. I mean, men do get breast cancer as well. In cultures in which there are no bras, there's virtually no breast cancer. It's background for both men and women. As soon as women start wearing bras, their incidence of breast cancer rises. When it goes over 12 hours a day, it starts to really get big. And women who sleep with their bras 24 hours a day of wearing bras, which has become extremely common, unfortunately, uh, then their breast cancer rates skyrocket to over a hundred times greater than a bra-free woman. I mean, that, that's that's a stunning statistic. Um, I mean, it's not a subtle. You know, sometimes you hear of studies where you know you have a 0.35 percent in chance of yeah. this if you do that. This is a these are big numbers. These are huge numbers, and, and the difference between men and women in breast cancer incidence is a hundredfold. So this is this is the the bra is the difference. And it's throughout the world. Wherever there are no bras, there's no breast disease. It's, it's just a bra phenomenon. Because what happened was the corset, which was killing women for centuries because of, of the, the body image distortion problem they had back then, uh, it took centuries to get rid of the corsets. And people were trying to get rid of them. Health reformers knew that they were damaging women because of compression injuries and circulatory problems. They couldn't breathe. And, and, but everybody had to wear a corset. It was essential. And they wouldn't be caught dead in public with that one. Well, finally, it was broken down into the girdle and the bra. So the bra is basically a breast corset. And we live in a breast binding culture. And just, you know, and just saying that should sound so obvious. But what's really remarkable to me, Stefan, is that you go to cultures where they do these things and they tolerate it. Women put up with this. Even in foot binding uh, that was done in China for centuries, I think it was like a thousand years, women's feet were de deformed and even toes rotted away from constriction of the um, of, of this bandage around their feet to, to, to make them fit into these tiny shoes all made to basically hobble the women so that the men knew where they were. And they got erotic pleasure unwrapping their feet and cleaning them and things like this. And that went on for centuries, you know, and obviously it was destroying women. So, you know, we humans seem to have this predilection to trying to change the way our bodies look. And we, we consider those artificial changes to be aesthetically pleasing somehow. And it really doesn't matter. It's just the change seems more important than anything else. And then we, we eroticize it and it becomes institutionalized in, in clothing and other industries that are dedicated to creating that image. And then there's a medical industry that's happy to clean up the dam, you know, to keep on treating the problem. Uh, they, you know, it's an endless source of income when you have damaging lifestyles for the medical profession. So that's, that's what a culturogenic disease is. It's a disease and that's what I study as a medical anthropologist. These are diseases, they're caused by our culture, and it's embedded not just in your simple behavior. Your behavior is enculturated 
so that you don't even question it. And there are institutions that support that. So it becomes very difficult to stop these harmful cultural practices. But I'm glad to say people have gotten the message since 1995, and it's become a grassroots phenomenon, and it's around the world now. Um, Dress to Kill just came out two years ago in Korean. Uh, the, the Koreans have found that their women are now having huge rates of breast cancer. They now wear their bra, 80% of the women there are wearing bras 24 seven. And they, they bought into it and it's killing them, literally. Uh, so uh, the information is now around the world and more and more women are hearing about it, but there's a lot of industry resistance, obviously, because uh, this is gonna be like class action lawsuits, like with the tobacco industry and what that did to people. The, the, the lingerie industry has been damaging women and they know it. And they're, they're just bracing and hoping that, that uh, the studies aren't done so that the lawsuits can't, be, can't happen. And that's why there's been a real um, resistance to all of this. What, what's a little odd, of course, here is there, the two of us, two men, are discussing women and uh, you know, bras and that kind of thing. But your book, you actually had a co-author uh, who was a yes. woman as well, right? Yes, my wife. I, in fact, it was because of her experience that we got into this. Uh, I, I, you know, my background is in medicine, anthropology, and biochemistry. And I uh, integrate those to look at how our culture makes us sick. And, and I train my wife to work with me on these things. She has a, a background in environmental management, and she was an optician. And uh, together, we started looking at how culture was affecting us. And when we were in Fiji doing some research, she was pregnant with our son, now 20 years old. Um, and she suddenly discovered some lump, a lump in her breast, which scared the heck out of us. And uh, we, we didn't know what could have caused it. Uh, we started questioning it. But the interesting thing that happened was a week prior to that, we were on a remote island in Fiji, and Soma was wearing bras back then, and she was washing her bra out and, and hanging it on a line. And this young Fijian girl comes over and says, you know, what is that? I mean, she never even saw one of these things. So Soma explained to her, you know, it's kind of weird to have to tell someone, what is a bra for? Well, you got to hold your breasts up. I mean, why? Uh, you know, there's no really good explanation for that. And then, she, you know, the girl looked at it and held it and felt it. And she said, well, isn't it tight? And Soma, Soma said, well, I guess you, it is, but you sort of get used to it. And that was like, a, it stuck in our brains a little bit because it was an unusual encounter. And then a week later, we discovered this lump. So we come back to the United States in a, a, a panic. Uh, what are you going to do? You know, you're pregnant. You're not going to want to play with x-rays, radiation, chemo, if it was anything really bad. We didn't even know what it was. I mean, you didn't want to start getting, even looking for what it could be could cause problems. So the first question that we ask is, what caused this? You know, it, it just didn't come out of nowhere. What did we do that caused this? So as she took her clothes off, after this long ride back from uh, flight back from Fiji to California, um, we, you know, we went to take a shower and she, I'm looking at her, her body and her breasts and I'm looking for clues. And the first thing you see are these red marks and indentations left by her bra. And I've seen them before. We've all seen them. And, you know, everybody knows that that bras leave that everything tight leaves that. But the significance eluded me before. Suddenly I'm looking for clues and this is significant. This is a sign of constriction. And if you constrict the lymphatic system, which is very easily constricted, you can cause fluid to build up in the breasts and that's why women get cysts and you can cause all sorts of toxification of the breast tissue as it gets basically secondary lymphedema and then it gets exposed. So we're exposed to pollution in our world and it goes through our body and it can't flush out if the bra is tight and keeping these, the, the fluid in the breasts toxic and congested. And over time, that causes degeneration and can lead to cancer. So that was our theory. And then we interviewed these women about their bra wearing. And we figured if, if this was true, then, then bra wearing women should have a history of tighter and longer bra wearing. And, and actually, they do. And it was incredible. And uh, what was more incredible is that nobody else was did any of it. Nobody looked at this. I mean, it's like, if you have a foot problem, you'd think of shoes. If you have a lung problem, you'd ask about smoking. 
If you have a breast problem, you would ask about bras, but they didn't think about it because science medicine doesn't think of women as cultural entities. It thinks of them as biological entities that they could even model in dogs or rats. So they don't think about how humans behave. And that's why my model of research has revealed not just this, but many other lifestyle caused diseases that are that this we're killing ourselves. It's the leading cause of our problems, but but we don't think about it. So I, you know, I've told many women about this study, uh, especially at, at Bear Oaks and people who are trying naturism, and they all say, you know, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a man. I have to have a bra. Uh, if I don't, it hurts. It's very uncomfortable. I get, uh, you know, pain, and uh, my breasts will sag and be horrible. I'm sure you've heard all that. What, what's your answer to that? Well, I had an interesting experience in Fiji that answers that. I went to, uh, there were, we were talking to some very large-breasted women in Fiji who did not wear any bra whatsoever. I mean, only about, at the time we were in Fiji in the mid-90s, only about half the women were wearing bras, and those are the professionals, and those are the ones who were starting to get breast disease. Uh, the ones who, they never had that problem in Fiji until bras started coming in. But these, these large-breasted women would say, I'm too big to wear a bra. So they had a whole different conception. To them, they were comfortable, bra-free. Their breasts did not droop. They were like normal, healthy breasts. And when you wear the bra, uh, what actually happens is your breasts become reliant on the external support, which is like a harness. And that creates atrophy of the ligaments that support your breast naturally in, in the, the uh, built into the breast tissue in your chest. So if you like if you wear a, a girdle, it'll make your abdominal muscles weak. If you wear a bra, it makes your breasts weak and they get flabbier. And um, they, so the, these are the, this is the answer. So we are conditioned to think that if you're large-breasted, you need a bra. Women were not designed by nature to be flawed creatures that need 20th century lingerie. I mean, it's just ridiculous. That's all salesmanship. Now, I will say that if a woman has been wearing a bra all of her life since puberty, her breasts probably have damaged lymphatics, they're probably filled with fluid, and they're heavy, and when they take their bras off and they feel discomfort, that's a sign of disease. You should not feel uncomfortable standing naked. There should be no pain standing naked and walking. And the movement of the breasts, by the way, pumps the breasts. The lymphatics move by the circulation in these tiny lymphatic vessels that drain our fluids and, and take the fluid to lymph nodes, mostly in the armpit for the breasts. These are very easily constricted, and they, they need movement of the body to circulate. And there are little valves that are one way to keep it flowing as your body moves. It pushes it along. And when you're walking, bouncing, and doing all of that, your breasts have an internal mechanism to flush. And they're, they're a skin organ that creates milk. I mean, they have a very extensive circulatory system and lymphatic system and because they're very active when they are active and they uh so movement helps them flush and flow and if you cage up the breasts in a tight bra that movement is gone the breasts get heated they get constricted the the pressure of the bra cuts down on the lymphatic drainage so they get built up fluid that leads to cysts and pain and so it's just so easy for women to test this on themselves themselves you don't have to believe me i mean listen to your body get rid of your bra for a month and you'll never be able to put that bra back on again. I don't care how comfortable you think it is right now. You will never be able to wear that bra again because you will see how tight it is once your body feels what freedom is like and your breasts are able to, to they'll be able to bounce again, by the way. When my wife got rid of her, her bra, her breasts were, kind of, were sore, uh, moving, and after a lot of breast massage and movement and no bra, uh, she started within months. She started getting more comfortable even running with it. Now she could rebound and bounce and let her breasts move. Doesn't have to hold them to secure them or keep them from – they're comfortable. They feel good being bounced. So it's like the, the body will heal hopefully unless there's too much too bad damage, but usually we heal. So the best thing to do is remove the problem, which is this constrictive garment. Now, your, your book and your conclusions were not uh, without its critics. Um, in <laughs> fact, still today, the American Cancer Society on their website says there is no evidence to support the idea that bras cause breast cancer. Right. What do you say to that? Well, that doesn't mean there's... Well, it's an interesting statement to that one. So many things I've said to that one. First of all, the reason the evidence is uh, limited, and there is evidence, there's two studies that say bras cause breast cancer, 
mine and a study out of Harvard in 1991 that found that bra free women had uh, 50% of the rate of breast cancer as bra wearing women in that study. So there are two studies that show bras cause breast cancer, and there's none that refute it. In other words, this issue has been blacklisted so that they are not doing the research. So when they say a statement that there is no study supporting this, they're, they're, first of all, it's false. There are two studies. Second of all, if you leave it so that no one looks at it, you can try to get away with that type of a statement. So they're putting their heads in the sand and saying, hmm. oh, there's no evidence, no evidence, we're not gonna research it. They're not saying we did studies that show this is false. They didn't do any studies to refute this. And in fact, if you look further, the American Cancer Society will say that this doesn't even deserve a study, that this is too preposterous a theory to deserve research. Hmm. That's what they say. I mean, they'll research anything under the sun but this. They refuse nope. to look at bras. Now, you tell me why. I think I know why, but what do you think? Why would a medical industry refuse to do the research into this? Well, I know that from the, uh, I, I had some interesting conversations uh, about vitamin D uh, and the sun, and the issue there seems to be that since nobody benefits from a free cure, there's nobody to fund the research. Exactly. Well, in this case, there's negative incentive. There's a disincentive to do the research. First of all, the bra industry, after my book came out, promptly created a, a foundation to fund breast cancer research. And they do it with sales from bras, believe it or not. It's like a hmm. surreal nightmare. And they tell women to wear, they have celebrities. I mean, they have the money. You're talking about a multi, in Canada, you know how much bra sales are in Canada alone? Do you know how big an industry no. just bras? 6.5 billion. Wow. Just in Canada, okay? Is there gonna be any truth about this subject in Canada? The bra industry buys advertising. So all of the media, I've had media cancel stories because their advertisers threatened them. And the medical industry doesn't, they're being paid not to look at this. The drug companies that treat breast cancer are suppressing this because the treatment and the prevention of a disease are in conflict. I know that sounds weird, but that is a fact. And I found that out by talking to PR firms in Australia when I was doing PR there. I went around the world with this just to warn people. My book wasn't even in the country. I, this is in the, early, in the mid 90s when our information came out. We went around the world to warn women about this, to tell them to loosen up and see on yourself. And they all felt better. It was incredible. And it, it sustained the whole project because it's truthful and women can try it. But anyway, when we were in Australia, I talked to a PR firm because I wanted some help with PR. And she said, um, you know, first I said, do you have any lingerie companies? Because there'll be a conflict of interest. And she said, no, I don't represent any of that. So then when I came to meet her, she canceled just before the meeting. She said, I have a pharmaceutical company that I represent. And they said that they don't want me looking at this because there's a conflict between the treatment and the prevention of this. I had the same thing happen in New York with a PR firm. It was gonna, they were gonna release this information even before the book came out. I just wanted to announce my results. It was ignored by all the medical channels, women's groups, everyone ignored this, which I discussed at the end of Dress to Kill. And then, uh, so we went, that's why we had to put it in a book to the general public. I couldn't even get anyone to study this, think about it, or consider the issue legitimate. Because as soon as you say the word bras, you know, their, their minds go into sexy lingerie. And women think, oh, you're trying to just get me to take my bra off so you can see my nipples, you, you know, pervert. And that's the kind of cultural uh, imposition, you know, the cultural problem to the serious consideration of this in the mid 90s. But I think we've come a long way since then. And I think the issue is much more uh, you know, easy to deal with and access acceptable, but the medical industry is still suppressing it. They refuse to look at it. And you got to realize how embarrassed they are. I'm a medical anthropologist outside of their industry. So I'm an outsider and I have a fresh perspective looking at it differently. And insight comes when you're outside the system. I'll tell you, you get different insights. So I approached this differently. I saw a link that they never thought about, which now basically shows why all of the med all of the research into breast cancer has been so inconclusive. That's why they don't know what's causing 70 to 80 percent of the cases. They don't know. They ignored the bra. I think that's that's it. That's the 70 to 80 percent. But they, as long as they don't do the research, they uh, uh, you see this makes them look inept. It's like studying lung cancer and ignoring whether they were smokers. If you study mm -hmm. breast disease in a woman 
and you ignore whether she was a bra wearer, what kind, how long, and how much damage she did to herself, then you have a huge variable on breast health that's invalidated your study. So they would have to admit their ineptness, and they're being, they're being paid to study for chemicals, and I've been told by them they're gonna be blacklisted if they even look at this. Because when the American Cancer Society says that they don't believe in this, then if you're a doctor getting an American Cancer Society grant, you're not gonna look at this. That's the way medicine works. These people on grants don't wanna bite the hand that feeds them, and if there are conflicts, which there are always in this, the conflicts of interest are keeping this from being legitimately addressed. Now, given the fact that after 20 years now, since the book has come out, just about 20 years, and the fact that this is considered one of the biggest, quote, myths, and so forth, it would be appropriate for them to just do a study and disprove it if it was so easy to disprove. But their response is, oh, no, 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 it's not even legitimate question which sounds to me like a real guilty conscience. They're trying to protect themselves. But unfortunately, in this culture, these guys are the authority. And therefore, the media the media bows to them. The governments are run by them. They're the, they're the people who are the advisors on all these committees. The Canadian Cancer Society had a person in Canada, in the Canadian press, this is a very rec recent thing, by the way. There was an article that came out. There's a, a pink and green, uh, it's called no pink and green ribbon campaign in Canada, where there are these activists, a small grassroots group of activists in BC area that are trying to, um, they, they see the pink campaign, which has become this commercialized thing that is selling even ca carcinogenic products to raise money for cancer. You know, it's just the whole thing has been one typical marketing um, perversion. And they are trying to bring the green back into it. And they are into the bra issue as well. And there was an article about them in the Canadian press that went throughout Canada. But typical of them, they had to find, the press had to find the balance. So they went to a Canadian Cancer Society person out of BC, at UBC. And she said a lie, she, which I called her on and I got them to change the story, but they didn't change it in a responsible way. She said that studies have shown that bras don't cause breast cancer. And they don't, there's nothing, there hasn't been one. I contacted her, I emailed her. I said, you said studies have shown this. I'm really interested because I need to know about those. Can you please give me the references? She said, no, no, I, I didn't mean studies. I meant opinions. There's a lot of uh, you know cancer societies and cancer experts that don't agree with you. And it's their opinion that you're wrong. I said, well, that's not studies. So you need to correct that. You need to call the newspaper and correct. She said, no, I'm, I don't think it's misleading. I'm not gonna correct it. So I contacted them and I got them to correct it, but their correction didn't say that there are no studies. It just said, it, it changed her words to say that, that experts don't agree or that the, and that there's insufficient research, that there's no studies that support this. That's the way they say it. And then they said in a prior edition, we said that studies, it was, there was an error that said numerous studies showed that there were no, uh, no link between bras and breast cancer. And they didn't say, correcting the error, there are no such studies. They just said that a prior edition had an error saying that, new, that studies showed that, there, that bras do not cause breast cancer. So I couldn't even get them to be honest, but then you realize how much money is spent in Canada on bras. How much money is spent on bra advertising? What is the medical industry gonna do about this? And they were justifying to me at UBC, I was talking to them, I said, you should censor this doctor. I mean, she's giving false information, telling the public in a, in a Canadian press story that went all over Canada, in every little newspaper, saying numerous studies show. That, like, okay, if I was reading that, I would say, okay, it's been looked at and it's been dealt with. But it hasn't been, it's being censored and suppressed and then they didn't she didn't even want to correct it well they were justifying it saying well you know when we say studies sometimes we mean opinions that's how some people speak and i said are you kidding me well he stopped communicating with me after that but these people were getting themselves in deeper and deeper into their ineptness their cover-up and their refusal to deal with this issue so i think it's criminal and, and and that's that's the bottom line i've been dealing with this now all these years Thank goodness that there are grassroots people still dealing with this, that naturists caught on to this early on. They were the ones on top of this. The naturist community totally embraced this because it was no surprise. 
And, and that's what's kept it alive. And the fact that when you get rid of your bra, you feel better. You get rid of fibrocystic breast disease within days, if not a few weeks, it's done. And they feel so much better. It's proven to themselves how bras were hurting themselves. So it's not abstract. And in the meantime, the cancer industry is going to be protective. The medical industry, you know, that's the medical industry. The bra industry is going to be hoping that no research is ever done uh, because they're going to be up the creek. There's going to be class action lawsuits. How do you have a, a well-fit push-up bra? I mean, bras that are designed to deliberately constrict and compress, you know, they're designed to be to, to destroy the breasts. I mean, they're going to destroy the breasts. They are not lymphatic friendly, and they know it. And now you see all these patented bras coming out saying, oh, we're good for the lymphatics. They're like selling filtered cigarettes after cigarettes and lung cancer was finally acknowledged after 30 years. They came up with filtered cigarettes. Well, they're coming up with new bras trying to, to, to compromise. Um, I don't think they work, but that's how the markets work. That's how the culture has dealt with this. The, your critics of, uh, don't even seem to recognize that this is a valid study. They say the methodology is flawed, that you don't have the credentials to do it, that it was never published in a journal. Right. What do you say to that? Well, if they don't like it, do your own. But my study stands. It's a good study. I came to them. They ignored it. Um, it is an anthropology study. It's a medical anthropology study. It's not epidemiology. It's not giving people drugs. I interviewed them with a questionnaire. The questionnaire showed a big link. It's supposed to lead to follow-up research. They didn't do the follow-up because they don't want this to be the answer. They sell drugs and surgery. They don't sell camisoles. So as a result, they're not interested in these answers. Uh, so they're just this is just industry protectionism. Yeah. So uh, there's also another uh, criticism I read where they said that the there's other factors that you didn't take into consideration. For example, that women with smaller breasts are less likely to wear bras and bigger breasts are more likely to have breast cancer. We were hoping this study would just be a preliminary to see if this made sense. And boy, did it make sense. So it should call for more research. In the meantime, women should loosen up. Um, but you can't study every variable when you do a study. If it's not relevant to the thing you're studying, you always have variables you don't know. I mean, that's the nature of research. You're studying an unknown thing, so you don't know all the multiple variables. So all you do is you try to control for variables that, that are related to your study, and the ones that don't seem related, you don't have to worry about. So like wearing, if, if it wasn't related to bra wearing, I didn't need to worry about that variable. And also, nothing has ever linked with breast cancer more than a few fold increase of any of the variables that they've ever looked at, even genetics only increases your chance of breast cancer like three to four fold. What we found was over a hundred fold by looking at the bra. So if it was an artifact of some other factor, it couldn't be that big. So it was pointing straight to bra. I mean, there's no question that this needed further study and made so much sense. I mean, especially with the confirmation that when women took their bras off after our study came out and they heard all the media about this and they read the book, you know, they just take their bras off and they feel so much better. So if this was irrelevant, you'd think they wouldn't even feel any different. It's like, well, you know, why would it matter? It does matter, obviously. So I think the medical industry is just pulling, whatever they can figure out to try to avoid this. They could settle the whole thing by having a third party just do the kind of study we did. Ask, you know, get a group of women who have breast cancer and find out their bra wearing habits. You'll find that they'll wear them longer and tighter than other women. Better yet, try to find bra-free women, and you'll find that they won't have any breast disease. And you can go to cultures like this. This study could easily be replicated. I mean, it wasn't uh, that difficult. It was very similar to the first study on cigarettes and lung cancer. It was a survey. You uh, published a uh, follow-up book uh, called Get It Off. Is, uh, is there any different information? Should people uh, read both, or is oh, the yeah. second one enough? Actually, the, the, the first book, Get Dressed to Kill, is important to understand what we did with the big study, okay? And then understanding the issues about bras, how they work, how they affect the body, the science of it, and the anthropology of it, of that aspect. But we found after, the, after our book came out and we did all this public speaking, that many women were still having trouble just facing the day without their lingerie. I mean, we're talking about addictions here. And we started to see that industries were invested. The whole breast implant thing and body image and Barbie and, and 
just what we do with women and how we treat them and train them to treat themselves. So I started, I wrote this other book called Get It Off, which is very experimental in design because it includes a, a musical, like to be performed as a play musical. And each chapter starts with a vignette that describes an aspect of life related to this breast obsession and with some characters that carry through in each chapter. And it's the first one, for example, is a little girl wanting to look like Barbie and the body image issue and a little girl and she sings a song about, you know, Barbie and, and wanting, you know, that kind of a thing and make her breasts grow and, and all that. So we start exploring throughout the book different aspects of the breast problem. And in each, after the the paragraph, after the um, the part that has the play, I then discuss in essay form the issues. So if you're interested in the culture, uh, and by the way, that the, the musical was performed in in New York by uh, I, I worked in collaboration with a naturist, Leonard Lehrman, who uh, helped me with some of the music. I had the musical ideas, and he fleshed it out, and we ended up putting together as a musical review called the Booby Trap. And uh, in the book, it's called The Little Breast Play, but it was adapted by Leonard into The Booby Trap. And it's even some YouTube videos of The Booby Trap performed. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's very fun. It, it's, it's funny and ironic and tragic all at the same time because that's what breast cancer really – bras and the whole obsession really are. Uh, so that's what Get It Off is about. And then um, you know, we did some other research into other fields beyond the breast field that uh, – uh, and but dealing with clothing, you know, I would say this applies to men as well with anything tight, you know, tight underwear, tight socks, tight shoes, tight neckties, uh, all tight clothing should be eliminated. I, I think elastic shouldn't be used in clothing because it's method of, of holding on is by tight. Anything that leaves a red mark or restricts your body is not good for it. You need to circulate with soft tissue. We need to circulate. Uh, and you, you just you want to keep your body free and flowing. Um, so the lesson is for both sexes. Now, I understand I've reached you in Hawaii. Yes, we have uh, escaped the mad, the mad rat race. And I found our sanctuary here and uh, where we have a, a nature preserve and a lifestyle retreat center. And we look at different we give people like a, uh, the opportunity for an out of culture experience to get away from all the cultural problems because we found people are sleeping wrong and they're uh, it's not just dressing wrong i mean we everything we do is wrong the culture is training us to do all these wrong things i'm coming out with a new book soon that's going to describe all of these other things uh, but we are there's the way we eat work sleep um, you know raise children everything our culture is training us to do isn't really consistent with uh, with our natural requirements. I shouldn't say everything, but there are major themes in our lives that are uh, counter to health. So we try to create, and we've created this model, alternative natural environment with lots of animals. And we have an interspecies community that we, of, of, uh, we have our own our goats, so we have goat milk and make cheese and we have sheep and horses and chickens and dogs and cats and, and nature and wildlife and fresh fruits that we pick. And it's like living in Eden. It's absolutely beautiful. You can grow your food year round, so you know what's in your food, which is very important. So it's it's like our culture is making us sick with more than just bras. I mean, it's that's. I'd say that's the tip of the iceberg, but that sounds like a pun. Um, anyway, so we we uh, we actually we welcome new naturists here. Um, I walk naked on my property. It's there is nothing so liberating as just being completely naked, walking in nature, and I know you know that. And uh, that's what we, we try to encourage here. And, uh, and I think it's just um, people are transformed. You know, we have them sleep differently, dress differently, they're eating differently, they get in touch with, with what they're doing to themselves. And we, we, the first thing is getting in touch with your feelings. You know, our feelings tell us what's good and bad for us. Comfort and discomfort are very important warning signals. And we, turn, we learn to ignore them, whether it's ignoring the constriction of clothing or the discomfort of the way we're, we're doing things and the way we're sitting or driving or whatever you're doing in your life, we learn to ignore the discomforts because our culture has impositions of other things. We don't come first. Our own needs don't come first. From diaper training in the beginning all the way on, you learn to suppress your needs. And you know that that's why we're in trouble health-wise. So you need to rediscover your human animal, your, your, your natural self and your feelings. 
And then you could adapt that to any lifestyle anywhere on the mainland. You know, you don't have to be in Hawaii to be to be happy and healthy. You just have to learn to listen to your body again and eliminate the lifestyles that are causing you problems. And we help people recognize those and train them on how to do it. And we offer them self-studies. I have a self-study center online, which you can get through my website, killerculture.com. Um, and it uh, gives you self-studies, which are things that you can try on yourself. Like, for example, we have a breast self-study, and it's a very simple one. You get rid of your bra, and then you see how you feel. And you are, you're your own researcher on your own body, and you get to know the results. You don't have to worry about it being, an, it's not like taking a pill or doing anything that can damage you. You just see what it's like, and you'll discover all sorts of things and, and feel so much better. Same with sleep. We give people sleep advice on how to sleep better, and, and the sleep position is extremely important. So we show them that. Um, these are self-studies and other things with thyroid, and we found a lot of things that we do wrong that we give people opportunities to try a different thing as a lifestyle to see on themselves as a form of research if they feel better, and then they know that, that it's, it's, what was done it was bad and what they're doing now is good. Uh, it's very simple, very profound changes. It's, it's just um, it's a kind of healing that the medical industry is not interested in because it doesn't require an expert and their prescriptions to be healthy. It just requires ending the cultural cause of disease, which is your attitudes and behaviors that are dysfunctional, that don't allow your body to function properly. Well, that's all for this episode of The Naturist Living Show. Thank you for listening. My name is Stéphane Deschain, and I'm your host for this podcast. I'm also the owner of Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. You can find links to all the items that uh, have been mentioned in the show on our show notes on our website, which is found at naturistliving.bearoaks.ca. That's B-A-R-E, bearoaks.ca, of course. And please keep sending your comments and suggestions. I always appreciate reading them. The show's email address is naturistliving at bearoaks.ca. Again, that's B-A-R-E, bearoaks.ca, because we are in Canada. Join us again in about a month for the next episode of The Naturist Living Show. This episode of The Naturist Living Show was brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Traditional values means that naturism is more than just taking your clothes off. It is a life philosophy with physical, psychological, environmental, social and moral benefits. Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park strives to promote those naturist values in a modern setting that provides the amenities and services that our members and visitors expect. Free your body, free your mind. Learn more at www.baroaks.ca.